Hi, I'm Joel Rinsmo, Managing Artistic Director with Cantor Eye, and I'm here with a very special guest today. We're going to change things up a little bit for our last concert of our 21-22 season, and we thought we would come together on video and uh, talk through our program that we're going to be doing. Instead of our traditional program notes in our program, we're going to be sending this out to our patrons and putting it online and making it available for people to uh, hear the music that Cantor Eye is going to be performing uh, later this month, but also get to meet Roger a little bit more up close and personal than uh, reading about Roger in the program notes. Um, this is the first year of a three-year artist in residency with Roger. Um, Cantor Eye announced that um, development back in December of 2020, and four months after that, we were shut down with COVID. So uh, we're really thrilled to be ending our first season uh, back in, in, in full uh, steam ahead with Roger at the helm. And so I thought I'd just ask Roger a little bit about himself. Um, tell us who you are, Roger. <laughs> That's a loaded question, Joe. I know. Um, you know, I, I'm going to start, since you, I'm off the cuff, right? Yeah, uh, we were just talking about uh, an event that happened here at Plymouth a few weeks ago, oh, a week ago, really, and um, there was an introduction made of me, and I wasn't prepared to hear that, and one of the things I thought that was so interesting about it, which I did say as soon as I got up to, to do what I was here to do, is that it felt to me, or it seemed to me, that everything that was mentioned in that bio had nothing to do with what I was about to do which was interesting on a number of levels. So I was here for a lecture series providing music and essentially I functioned as a worship leader, um, which none of that is in my bio, uh, at least not the current bio, the short scripted program bio that's 250 words. So one of the things that it did say to me and as a person who has studied theology and does a lot of theological reflection is that those 250 words do not fully encapsulate and communicate who I am and what it is that I do. Which is why I'm asking. Yes. <laughs> so, to your point, I know I do a lot of preamble to get to the point. Um, I'm a person who is uh, literally the sum of my experiences, you know. I started studying piano when I was about eight or nine years old, but sang in the, the children's choir at the church that I eventually uh, became a member of. So I had my classical training but was singing and then started doing choir directing at about 14 years old. I found a church job playing at a Presbyterian church in the Bronx. So I'm from New York. That's quite a jaunt from Brooklyn, New York up to the Bronx. I had to take two trains on a Sunday morning at probably seven in the morning to get there directing a youth choir once a month. I rehearsed them probably twice a month. And I'm traveling at 14 and 15 by myself. Uh, first of all, that means my parents trust me. They, they believe I can do this. The fact that somebody hired me at 14 years old means that they had respect for me and trusted me to do a job. And it was a job because I got paid. <laughs> so here's a 14 year old with, I'm not delivering papers. I'm not working in a store stocking shelves. I am playing music at a church at 14 years old and getting paid for it, which was really exciting for me. And then I, I auditioned and was accepted to the high school performing arts. Um, I actually finagled my way into that. Not the audition, but the attendance, because my father uh, didn't want me to go there. He wanted me to go to the sister school, which was the high school of music and art, which was higher up in Manhattan in Harlem on 135th Street. And the reason he wanted me to go to that school was because they had a stronger academic program. But I wanted to go to performing arts because in my mind, and according to the literature, that was a stronger arts program. And so I kind of, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, procrastinated and uh, passed the deadline to make the transfer and reapply to the other school. And uh, then I said, oh, Dad, I missed the deadline. I can't go. I have to go to perform my arts. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so that's how I really wound up. I mean, I did make it into PA, but uh, I didn't want to go to music and art. And so I did get to go to performing arts. My father was like, Argh. but then I went. I was fine. I was fine. Did my piano uh, degree, studied there. 
Um, joined the Boys Choir of Harlem, which was great. Another story with that. So before I auditioned for the Boys Choir of Harlem, I auditioned for um, All City High School Choir. Um, that was fun. Um, I forget the name of the director right now, but he was legendary, especially in New York. But they only rehearse once a week and perform twice a year. Boys Choir of Harlem, twice a week, and then many more performances as major performances started coming up. We toured, we were always performing. So I was like, all city, Boys Choir, all city, boy, Boys Choir of Harlem! <laughs> so I, I wound up singing with them for a while. Um, I joined late, but I got in because they were looking for tenors and basses. I was 16 when I auditioned, and I read music. <laughs> so oh, that was rare bird. Yeah, that was in my favor. I could read the music. Didn't take me long to learn stuff. I could sing on pitch. So that was a great opportunity for me. I learned a, a whole lot. Um, my musical experience, palette, and, and exposure. Uh, increase exponentially being in that organization. Now I'm singing in Italian. Well, we didn't do a lot of Italian, but we did Latin, we did sacred choral works. We sang in German, we did a lot of Bach. We did motets, we did cantatas. Um, Latin, we did Mozart's Requiem with orchestra. I mean, I had wonderful experiences with them. I learned a lot about black music, uh, jazz, which I had not learned and was singing. Of course, spirituals. Our director had gone to an HBCU and he brought that experience and shared it with us. So I, I just learned a lot. We traveled to Europe a few times, Japan twice, nationally multiple times, graduated. Uh, was on staff as a keyboard accompanist, uh, eventually an assistant conductor. And when I finished my degree, both at Westminster and Manhattan School of Music, was on staff, first faculty, and then when I graduated, I think Manhattan School of Music became the director of artistic art education. So go back, you got a degree from Manhattan School of Music mm -hmm. and Westminster Choir College. Yes. Those are the two of the top schools in the world. <laughs> but they're not both in choral. So, so you're, you were a major choral geek going through school, high yes. school. Yeah. Um, what degrees did you get at Manhattan and uh, Westminster? So Manhattan, my graduate degrees in piano performance. Um, I followed up what I started to a degree at, uh, at uh, uh, Westminster. So the, my journey to Westminster was interesting. I'm not going to give you the entire backstory for that, but I started at Brooklyn College and transferred to Westminster Choir College. Um, needed a change and when I entered Westminster I was a piano performance major but I wanted to get singing lessons and so I learned how to play the system I trans I, I switched well it seems to be a, a thing with me right learning yeah. learning how it works so I changed degrees I didn't have to apply or do any audition I changed my degree from piano performance to music education why because as a music education, I could do something that, I don't know if they still do it now, but I could double principal, which means I could have two principal instruments. And as a double principal, I didn't have to pay extra for private lessons. Perfect. <laughs> and why music education? I figured, well, I didn't need a degree in church music to play in church. I said, they don't hire you without a degree in church music. And I was already playing in church without a degree. And you don't need, I would have access to the same quality and the same person for my private uh, piano lessons. So the quality of education and instruction was going to be the same. But if I majored in education, I could get a teaching certificate and teach in public schools. And I am certified, I don't know if it's still valid, but certified to teach in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. I started the New York certification process, but it was a little more extensive. The testing was a little longer. I had to spend an extra six hours in testing, and I got bored. I didn't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't figure a way to beat the system there. No, no. So I wound up not getting certified in New York, and um, yeah, so I, that's how that worked. <laughs> you also have degrees in theology. Yes, that was, I'll say, by divine design. Yeah. I wasn't planning to, uh, through a number of circumstances, which is a longer story, I wound up directing the Gospel Choir at Union Theological Seminary. And I already had a connection with Union because of the, a group called the Ebony Ecumenical Ensemble. And they were formed from, at that time, current seminary students and their wives, which is interesting because I said their wives, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, 
male seminarians <laughs> and their wives. Of course, there are, it's a co-ed place. But anyway, that's another story. But uh, yeah, so the groups got started probably somewhere around, um, I don't know, 1978, 1980, something like that. And uh, Joseph Joubert, a wonderful friend of mine, pianist extraordinaire, and uh, he asked me to start helping out when he couldn't be there as, a, as an accompanist for the group. And Betty Forbes, who was the director of the group, her husband taught at the seminary at the time, James Forbes, who was also pastor at the Riverside Church. Yes, of course. So that was my connection. And they did, because they started at Union, they did all their concerts at Union, even though it wasn't technically a group, but it came from Union Seminary. Uh, so the, off, the director of the Office of Worship, Troy Messenger, knew about me, and they were at this point on their third or fourth director. They were looking for somebody. Two or three people recommended me. Um, initially, I didn't want to do it, but I said, all right, let me see, and I auditioned and, or applied, interviewed. They offered me the job, uh, and that's how I wound up at Union. And then somewhere around year seven, eight, or nine, I wasn't, I didn't get the bug, but I was being nagged by the ground of being, one of the terms we like to use there for one of the many theologians we study. And so I was being hounded from on high until I said, yes, I will go to seminary. And then I was let alone. And then I uh, had a first year and a half that was very tumultuous, mostly because I felt like I had to give up. I, I'm, I'm a fully committed person. And so I quit my church job to do that. So I would be fully in. I was there full time, fully concentrating. But um, to do that, I had to leave my church gig. And it was hard. I wasn't doing anything but seminary work. And I was like, God, you took music away from me. But you know, that's how it went. And somehow I had an epiphany about midway through. And, and you know, as a musician, uh, this is all I was doing. I said, I'm an accomplished musician. As a theologian, I was a neophyte, and um, that was hard. Yeah. You know, to come from a place where I had studied and devoted so much time, knew so much about the craft, and now I'm studying a new discipline and know nothing. I, I discovered there is a plethora of ologies. <laughs> <laughs> it drove me crazy. I kind of went in the deep end taking systematic theology with James Cone. Mm -hmm. And we had 18 books on the syllabus. Wow. And I think we pretty much got through all of them. I, my head was spinning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's Union. <laughs> and you've done some work on Broadway. Yeah. Yeah. How'd that come about? Uh, connections. And I will say that's divine connections because I'm an introvert and I don't talk to people, but <laughs> I've been put in contact with folks. So I knew a few of the people that were playing and they said, Raj, would you be interested in like uh, uh, subbing on Broadway? So that sounds interesting. And that's how I got my first gig playing the color purple. Crazy. Um, somebody wanted me to take their seat and sub for them. And I did. It was a lot of fun, a lot of pressure, because usually you don't get a rehearsal. You get the book, you sit in, in the pit and see a couple of the shows, and then you, you're just, on. You're on. Wow. <laughs> so what brought you to Denver then? It sounded like you, you had a career going in New York, Broadway, uh, church music, uh, theologian. Right. Yeah. Uh, what brought you out this way? What brought you out west? Spirituals Project yeah. here at the University of Denver. Uh, I wasn't looking for the move, but I was looking to do some different things. And a friend of a friend, uh, both of whom I know, uh, told me about this opportunity. One of them knew I was looking to make a change. Uh, and uh, around the time I turned 50, I had this probably what a lot of 50 year olds have this, this you know, existential, I won't say crisis, but the questioning. It's like, why? You know, <laughs> what am I doing? Why am I doing? Where is this going? I need purpose about what does this all mean? <laughs> so a good friend and mentor, Marvin Curtis, who's a composer, uh, newly retired dean at uh, University of Indiana, Indiana University. Um, we had a we, we met at well we, we knew each other before that, but we attended a party and afterwards we were just sitting and chatting. And he helped me put things into focus. And he said to me, what brings you the greatest joy? What is your greatest passion? And I thought, surely it's choral music. That's what I love. And when I thought about it, it's actually not choral music. It's teaching. 
even in the choral setting, what I enjoy most about it is the learning and the teaching of the music, not the performing. I mean, I don't dislike the performing, but I get the most joy when the choir gets it, when we understand what we're singing, when you're trying to impart uh, uh, concepts and, and tone and musical ideas and, and line and passion. That, to me, is, is the joy. Um, and when I thought about it, I've always had a passion for teaching. And then when this position came up, here's the theological part of it, it just made sense. It was like God said, this is what you said you like. <laughs> this is where you said your heart is. And I had two offers in New York at churches, but then this came up. And when I came out and interviewed and I started weighing and I did that thing where you do the, make pros the list the and the pros and the cons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the pros outweigh the cons. And I said, okay, might as well do this. Well, we certainly are fortunate here in Denver to have you in our midst. And for all of these reasons you've mentioned, um, even before we talked about this collaboration with Kandurai, we reached out and connected and yeah. had meals together and talked. And, and I think we had talked, you know, off and on about, hey, it'd be great to do something together. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I don't even remember who had the idea about doing something like this. It's very unique for Kandurai. They've done a lot of collaborating over the years, but never really taken a deep, deep dive like this with a, another conductor, another musician. Um, I'm going to say this is your brainchild. I don't think I could have conceived it. I wouldn't have been that forward. <laughs> well, I, you know, um, I consider us friends, but also, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, your experience and expertise and, and the consummate musician you are, you got to hear him sing. He plays piano, but man, he rocks it. Um, and so it just made sense um, to move forward with this collaboration. I'm really glad we have. Um, Cantorai um, has been around for 24 years now. They've got a pretty rich history of commissioning and championing new works. And and and, uh, um, and if you don't know, if you're new to Cantorai, Cantorai is predominantly a white choir um, with kind of the Lutheran choral tradition uh, steeped into its its bloodstream. Um, they've done spirituals. They've done um, uh, I don't ethnic music, spirituals, around the world music, but certainly is not their specialty. And um, I know that as a conductor, I've been very hesitant to program spirituals because it's not a genre that I'm comfortable with primarily because it's not part of my history. Um, and so when I have done them, I've taken it very seriously and done a lot of research, but there's nothing like hearing from a specialist. And that's what I would consider you as a specialist in, in, in black American music. Um, so a lot of, in fact, it was one of the very first questions um, one of our singers posed to you on your first rehearsal is, you know, is this appropriation what Cantor is doing, doing a whole program of spirituals and work songs? Um, and, and I think our audience would love to know the answer to that, your answer to that. There's no right answer, I, I think, and you've been very clear about that. But what are some of your ideas um, um, and, and beliefs about, a, again, a predominantly white Waspy choir uh, performing spirituals. Right. Well, you know, after <laughs> the event within the event, the pandemic within the pandemic, the, and I'm talking about May 20, May 2020, that that raised. Uh, this is not a new question, and certainly it existed before that. But I think the attention to that question has been heightened since since the events of May 2020. And I've done a lot of thinking about it and a lot of talking about it. And where I have rested, the short answer is, if someone does, and this is for anyone, if you're doing music outside the culture, it's very important to do your research, but also to give honor, respect, and um, to acknowledge the source community. Uh, I think the, the biggest issue with appropriation is when people claim culture and, and art that is not uh, indi uh, indigenous to their culture as their own, start to claim ownership, authorship, and uh, present themselves as the authority in this music, and that's what becomes problematic. Um, because you, you it's disrespectful to the source community. and. Uh, on occasion, depending upon the circumstance, um, it can be robbery because if there are royalties or monies owed f 
from you know sales or uh, uh, the distribution of of intellectual property, which happened a lot in the 50s and 60s with black music, then that's appropriation. Um, but I think to to do music outside of one's culture, it the important things are again to do one's research. That means you you you, you research the culture, you research the history, the origins of this music. You and the same way we do with music of other cultures, especially within the Western canon, we, we prepare ourselves in terms of language, uh, in terms of context, uh, idiomatic characteristics that are normative for that particular genre. And then very often what many of us do is we seek an expert. You know, we go get a language coach. We listen to all kinds of recordings to immerse ourselves in the sound and everything. And a lot of times people don't do that. And then of course, you give appropriate uh, 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 citation and credit to the source community. This was written by this person, this was arranged by so and so, this comes from this part of the country. And then you try to perform the music in a way that honors the intent of the composer and the source community. And then I think we can do this music without fear of disrespecting the culture and the source community and without fear of uh, engaging in appropriation. You said that your passion is teaching. I can tell you firsthand that I've learned so much. Um, I've been the bystander. I've been in the back of the rehearsal. You know, I'll tell you, um, I had said before that you, we never imagined that a pandemic would hit and that uh, you know, two years after we had this discussion and kind of made this formal announcement, it's hard for a conductor to turn over his ensemble not just in performance stage, but to turn over a whole program. But for me, it's been so gratifying, and I've learned so much. Um, as we talk about spirituals and work songs, which the audience will hear in this program, can you tell us, and it's impossible to do with limited time, but can you kind of share with our audiences what you've shared with the choir about the, the spiritual, the, the, um, the genre of the spiritual and the work songs and something that they can expect to hear in our upcoming performances and then we'll talk about some of the repertoire specifically but maybe just about the genre that they'll be hearing. Sure. Uh, one of the things that I've come to and specifically in the last couple of years is that one cannot engage in the music of the spirituals which emerged during the period of slavery in this country without attention to the idea of suffering. Um, the music was created in suffering by people who were suffering and they created music that helped them to cope with their suffering. <laughs> so if you don't engage with the suffering then you're really not engaging with the music. Even the most joyful spirituals were still rooted in, in suffering. The analogy, and I, I continue, continuously reevaluate my this analogy but so far it's held up uh, that I, I make the analogy of someone living with cancer and struggling I have some friends actually my one of my dear friends wife I don't know that the condition that she has but it's some kind of autonomic uh, condition where she's in constant pain her bones her bodies in pain but this woman gets up every day she has children she cares for them she goes to work but she's always in pain so the analogy I make is even someone like this I'm not saying she has cancer but this is someone who's living with pain is um, even if they're laughing and giggling and having a good time they're still in pain the pain is still there. They're just managing, and it doesn't mean that they can't experience joy, but the, the pain is still there. And that's what it was with these spirituals. Sure, people might have been dancing and singing and shouting and laughing and clapping, but they were still slaves. <laughs> they had no freedom. The danger of being beat for any small offense or infraction was a constant looming kind of a thing. So what does one do with that? And the music, is, I, won't, I won't go so far as to say it was the only coping mechanism, but it was a significant one. It was the thing that brought some joy, that gave them some relief, that gave them peace, that encouraged them to continue on, that when I didn't feel, when they didn't feel like going on, 
It gave them hope for what tomorrow might offer. And that is this music. Um, the music also, uh, much of it is imbued with coded messages. And so uh, whenever you hear words like Jordan, it, 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 yes, it refers to the biblical reference of that promised land and you know going to Canaan and all of that, but it also symbolizes and, and metaphorically speaking meant freedom and it meant heaven. And so when we hear that, when we sing, I stood on the river of Jordan and thought about crossing over, yes, crossing over into heaven. From, from, from this world into the next, from the land of the living to eternal life. But it also meant if I can cross that river that separates south from north, then I can move from uh, 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 slavery into freedom. So lots of stories like that. Rhythm is another thing that you've talked about quite a bit. Um, yes especially in the work songs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that, maybe. So I always like to go back to the source and to the origin. Scholars use the term African retentions, um, meaning that the people that were brought to this country from Africa and their descendants still have a connection to African cosmology and African idioms, one of them being Rhythm. Rhythm is so important to African culture and music. Um, the drum is central to African music making. And so um, one can never separate, according to scholar uh, Samuel Floyd, dance, drum, and song. They, they, they are all woven, interwoven together. Uh, so all the music has some rhythmic quality to it. Even the slower songs have rhythm infused into them. And to separate the rhythm is to take away the life engine of the music. It must always be there. Um, some of the quality of drum making is that drums often play together. Most often, it's very rare that you will hear a singular drum. There's at least going to be two or three, if not a whole what we call a family of drums, right? And so as a, 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 as a not a result, as a word I want to use, but um, it's inherent in that when you have family of drums, uh, you're going to have polyrhythms. So you're going to have multiple rhythms and the com complex rhythms that go along with that. Uh, here in the States, this idea of a, of a work song, um, the, the slave masters found it efficient for their slaves to work synchronized uh, uh, by a single driving rhythm. Hence the work song with this down up it, it, into that um, to that down up motion that even in the music we refer to it as down up a down beat and an upbeat and and so in this music the work songs did exactly what they said they they were songs that accompanied work and that infused the labor with a with a level of efficiency because as everybody's moves were synchronized to this pattern this rhythm not only they were they more efficient in in the quantity of their work they were also invigorated because the music gave them energy and so now you're working you're energized you're becoming more efficient so slave masters liked work songs more productive slaves <laughs> Let's talk about some of the repertoire that um, we'll be hearing on this concert. Uh, we start off with uh, a couple of pieces by Moses Hogan. Uh, yes. Probably one of the most well-known um, contemporary um, arrangers of spirituals. We'll be doing Elijah Rock, which um, I, I'm not sure the Cantor has done it. I, I, I heard that maybe early on the ensemble did it, although this, it, it's a lot of Devisi in this piece, and so right. it, it's not for a small ensemble. And then, as you mentioned, I stood in the River Jordan. What can you tell us a little bit about Moses Hogan and maybe what to expect of these two pieces? Sure. Um, it, I believe that Moses Hogan, in many ways, single-handedly revitalized the singing of the concert spiritual by community and concert choirs. Um, I think we experienced a lull, but when he appeared probably at one of the ACDA conventions and 
did Elijah Rock. The convention just erupted, we, like something we had never heard before, and certainly not with this fresh sound. His, his voice in the spirituals was new, it was unique, it was fresh, it was innovative, it was, uh, um, you know, it had all this energy and vibrancy to it. His, his harmonic construct, the way he saw it, he understood the choral instrument, if you would. Um, and like many composers before him, Bach, being probably one of the most prolific, wrote for the voices that he had. <laughs> and all the voices that Moses had, oh my Lord, how many of us have basses like that? <laughs> yep. And Cantorite does have we do. like We're that. We do, we're fortunate, yes. So, uh, but yeah, you know, his interpretation, the, probably the preeminent uh, arrangement of that was the Jester Hairston in G minor, but that, with those basses, it's not start with their laws or up, show, show. Everybody knows that. But he comes with this chant, with the basses in this fifth. And, and, and then it starts, even that chant, it, it conjures for me the sense of the drum. You know, there's the boom. Boom, boom, just calling forth something that's going to be announced. And then this ominous kind of eerie, oh, that, that wow, the awe, this mysterioso is coming forward. But then when the altos come over that, come on, Cinda, help me to pray, tell me. All of that, that's new, that's new material, that's, that's, that's a, a, a text that we have not seen in, in the arrangements of, of this spiritual. So his take on that, and almost immediately within the first two pages, certainly by the third page, we now have the polyrhythms. Mm -hmm. Because the basses are doing one thing, the tenors have this other motivic idea that's going forth, before the sopranos and altos now finally, after two and a half pages, give us the verse. So we have basically this very long introduction. Um, and then how he de you know, develops the piece, and all of the sonic and harmonic and compositional uh, stuff that's, that's contained in the piece. No wonder these musicians, these choral directors, just lost their minds after hearing this really masterpiece. Well, what's great is you're starting the program with this piece. Yeah. Starting our concert with this. It's often a concert closer. Right. Um, there are different programming philosophies around that, but you're starting it really just setting the stage for the rest of the program. Yeah, and, and, and for that exact reason. Yeah. To say, this is what you're going to hear. Yes, most people will do the showstopper at the end, but I said, why not use this to literally make a statement? This is the tone for the program. Yeah. What I really appreciate this program is there are a number of composers here that are very active right now. They're, some of them are younger composers that are setting, and like you said, Moses Hogan was kind of the first person to really start championing it and bringing a different um, harmonic language to it and, and a freshness to some of the spirituals. Yes, Jeffrey yes, Ames yes. Is, is one of those people, and we're doing a setting of I've Been in the Storm So Long, which is, to most people, um, a pretty common um, song that they've heard before, but um, Jeffrey wrote it for a particular event in mind, kind of as a reaction to that. Can you tell us a little bit about his setting? Certainly, if memory serves me correct, and if not, you'll correct me and we'll edit. Uh, I think it was Hurricane Katrina, right? Good, yes. Um, <laughs> good, I was like, oh, I messed that up. Uh, so he's written actually a couple of pieces that, that um, speak to tragedy, uh, um, and this was one of them that he's, he that was inspired by Hurricane Katrina. But I think what's also interesting about this setting by Jeffrey Ames is that here's a setting by an academic. You know, yes, he's, he's a musician. Yes, he's an accomplished, you know, uh, choral writer here. But I think he brings the, uh, the, 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 the scholarly voice and perspective to this composition. And it's not to say that, for instance, Moses Hogan is not, his, his range is not well crafted. But I see a lot of academic thought into this level of composition. Also, lots of divisi. Um, and I've, I've spoken to the choir about the intro in particular. When I look at that introduction, after he paints this, this tonal mosaic just in the opening two bars with this thick seven, eight part harmony, then the writing thins out into uh, what to me comes across as pianistic. You know, it's not, 
it's very instrumental. It's not vocal. And so I've tried to emulate that. How would this sound on an instrument with the, the voice parts coming in an eighth note apart? That's not necessarily vocal, right? It's not choral writing. So there's a certain rhythmic aspect to that that is not endemic and you know, inherent to the, the choral sound. And uh, there's a certain kind of approach to that if, if one is going for the clarity of the boom, 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 whether it's plucked instruments. Well, piano is not a plucked instrument, but certainly a percussion and, and, and this, the attack of the, the hammer on the string. So how can we give the rhythmic impetus, which then takes us back to African culture, drums, the rhythm becomes so important. And uh, I've, as, as we've engaged in the piece, I've, I've asked Cantuai to think of themselves as an accompanying instrument upon which the solo vocal line now sings on top of. Yeah, and a wonderful solo by Shannon Lemon Elrod singing soprano on that piece. One of the composers that I was not familiar with, and especially this piece, was Bound for Mount Zion by Robert Morris. One of the more difficult, surprisingly difficult pieces. On first glance, you think, oh, you know, this, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a great challenge for Cantorai. Tell us about this piece a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Robert Morris would not, well, yeah, in the choral world, for those who are familiar with his work, would, are, are familiar with the complexity of his writing. I think on some level, there are some composers, and I don't want to speak for Robert Morris, and if he sees this, he might, you know, just give me a call <laughs> afterwards, but, uh, especially now that he has my number, <laughs> but um, I think he's one of these people that certainly writes for art's sake. You know, I'm not creating, I'm not writing this with the idea that somebody is going to sing it. I'm writing this because I have an idea that I want to get out of my, I want it to get out into the world. And on some level, I'm not concerned if anybody sings it or not. I just want to create this beautiful artistic vision. And that's what he does. He calls upon not only his uh, 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 expertise being steeped in Western classical tradition, but he's invoking uh, the, the, the ethos of the Negro spirituals. He's calling forth the blues. He's calling forth a little bit, uh, a little bit of early gospel, particularly as it would have existed in Chicago. He, he grew up. He's part of the that Chicago era and tradition, um, and the quartet singing. Uh, so all of that is. I mean, all of that <laughs> is in this piece. Yeah. And you have to be able to maneuver and shift as he ebbs and flows within the course of this work. All of that is in there. The rhythmic complexities, the harmonic density, all of that is in this work. Yes. And you have to be able to bring that level of musical chops to this if you're going to pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason that not a lot of choirs do this piece. It, yeah. it's, it's tough. Yeah, it's yes, tough, it is. But, but singers are loving it. Uh, new on the scene, relatively new, is Brandon Waddles. And he's introduced um, a couple of new spirituals that weren't familiar to me. And you had mentioned that some of these just aren't set that, that often. There's a set of three, Sweet Jesus, which features Sarah Harrison as mezzo-soprano soloist, They Led My Lord Away, and Ride the Chariot, which is a little bit more familiar um, with uh, Zachariah Smith. What can you tell about this set and maybe a little bit about Brandon? Sure. So this, this was a commissioned work, uh, I think both by Yale and uh, the, there's a group, the Nathaniel Deck Corral, I believe, out, out of uh, uh, Canada. And um, Brandon, in many ways, has called on his own roots in, in multiple ways. That is to say, so first of all, Brandon is, is a product of the HBCU uh, uh, machine. He, he, he attended and graduated from Morehouse College. Um, so he has the influence of the current director, D David Morrow, but also Wendell Whalum, his predecessor. I actually saw Morehouse perform under Wendell Whalum when David Morrow was a student. He was graduate assistant. I'll never forget wow. that. And then here, Wendell Whalen passes away, and the student becomes literally the teacher and, and, and the heir apparent. Um, 
So all of that, it, it just means a lot to me, the, the carrying on of tradition. So Brandon inherits that. Uh, he's from Detroit, and the musical uh, experience and the culture that has evolved out of Detroit. His father is a well-known and accomplished jazz musician. Uh, but Brandon also is a child of this contemporary era. And his harmonic language, his ear, gravitates towards all of that. Gospel, jazz, the history of black music, and all of that is, is present in these arrangements. These arrangements call forth as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, a tribute to the, the people who have impacted his, his, his education, both living and the ancestors. Uh, uh, a Sweet Jesus is, a, is an homage to uh, Wendell Whalum. Even though Brandon didn't study with him, he's very much aware and, uh, of Wendell Whalum's contribution. Um, and, and his presence still lives very prominently on at, at, at Morehouse. Um, and there's a section where, so yes, this, uh, most of these pieces aren't well known, uh, the spiritual tunes that is, with the exception of perhaps Ride, uh, Ride the Chariot, which I think the uh, William Henry Smith arrangement is probably the most well known, which I also love. Uh, so, but, but, but uh, Sweet Jesus, I'm really only aware of the solo arrangement, which Wendell Whalum uh, uh, did, and it was published by uh, Roland Carter several years ago in a collection of solo spirituals. And uh, right before the last statement of the A section, there's an interlude where Brandon quite literally quotes, he doesn't put it in there, but if you know, you know. Uh, he, he quotes the solo arrangement by Wendell Whalum, the introduction, and it's just right in there. So. You know, I, 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 I see that and I appreciate it. I love it because it, it means that who Whalum was still matters today. And he wants to recognize the contribution and the impact that these, these, these giants continue to have on us, those who are aware of the spiritual tradition and those who research the spiritual. These are the, the people that you need to know and know their work and become aware of. Um, and then they led my Lord away, which was something I had not heard before. I'm not familiar with that spiritual, but you know, Brandon is now bringing these, which is another thing that these kinds of arrangements do. They they bring to our contemporary ears some of these songs that have not had the same life and presence as others have had. So it's great that he has put these these uh, collection of three songs together, um, and in the manner in which he has done that, you know, he understands the choral instrument. Uh, Brandon, we our biggest connection is probably our Westminster connection. He's a Westminster grad as well, and I met him there when he was a grad student. Um, but he's a phenomenal musician, both keyboard player and arranger in his own right. And um, what he did when he was director of the Westminster Jubilee Singers was phenomenal. Uh, the sound he got out and the clarity, the musical vision, and and, and oh, it was just it was just awesome. And so these these pieces are an extension, as with any composer, of who Brandon Waddles yeah. is. You mentioned the giants. Um, I do consider Roland Carter one of those giants in in the preservation and, and, and promotion of, of the genre. And talk about Roland's uh, settings that we'll be hearing. We're hearing right on Jesus, steal away in bright mansions above, and you must have that true religion. Um, talk about Roland's contributions. Oh. I, f I see Roland Carter as the continuation of, of the, the, the fathers of this tradition, or our elders, because we certainly have mothers as well, Evelyn uh, LaRue Pittman and Margaret Bonds, but uh, carrying on the tradition of Nathaniel Dett and William Dawson and Hall Johnson, just he, Roland Carter is the next generation of those great arrangers who understood the, the Negro spiritual, uh, maintain the integrity of the melodies. And what one of my uh, friends and colleagues likes to call the, the folk idiom of this, you know, a lot of the newer arrangements, for better or worse, kind of become true compositions in the sense that they take the melodies, but they, they lose the essence of the folk material, and now they've become these uh, uh, Western compositions, which I don't think is a bad thing, um, but what I think Roland Carter in, in his music has stayed in the essence of that, the folk music qu 
quality and essence of the music is there, uh, while bringing certainly a level of uh, uh, Western compositional prowess to, to, to bear with these. Um, and I, I wanted to do these particular, there's so many arrangements by Roland Carter that I love, um, but I wanted to do something that would be exemplary of his work and also of some of the spiritual melodies that we don't hear as often. Um, and so that's why these particular four, um, and then also because of who Cantora is, which I probably say more than I should, but uh, here's a, a choral entity that can speak these pieces in the way they ought to be s spoken of, um, that can bring the, 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 the musical uh, prowess to bear and still the sound of, 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 and the essence of these pieces in a way that is so profound and, and deserves to be heard. And uh, yeah, so and these are just examples of the writing of Roland Carter. And then we're inviting our very special guest, the Spirituals Project Choir, to join uh, us later on stage together, but they're going to perform their own set of music. Yes. Um, two again, or one by Moses Hogan, Hear My Prayer, and mm -hmm. one by yours truly, uh, Old Ship of Zion, and uh, then an arrangement by Stacy Gibbs. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about, um, briefly, the history of the Spirituals Project that you inherited and are taking to uh, the next levels. Sure. So uh, the, spirit, the origin of the Spirituals Project lies in uh, an idea that uh, our founder, Arthur Jones, had. He's actually a psychologist by training, uh, but he was invited to do a concert of, um, I guess, I'm not sure if he was asked to do spiritual specifically or that was just what he chose to do. But in the performance of this concert, he discovered that so many people just did not remember and know this music. Um, and so he decided to, <laughs> what literally happened, make it his life's work. Uh, and that thus was born the Spirituals Project. And even in our mission statement, we, 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 we recite every rehearsal, it is our mission to preserve and revitalize the music and the teachings of these sacred songs. And so that's what we continue to do. When, when I was brought on board to, as the choir transitioned from a self-standing um, community, not-for-profit organization to an entity of the University of Denver, it was my intent to uh, preserve its mission. Um, I had an opportunity not to do that, and somebody offered me to do something else, and I said, no, 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 no. This mission is so important and so specific, the integrity of that must be maintained. It must be maintained. And so that's what we do, both through performance, hence the choir, but also through education. Um, um, some of that is done through lecture or commentary during concerts, but also in specific um, dedicated educational uh, opportunities. One of the things I've done since my arrival at the university is to create this triennial programming where every three years we do either a symposium, um, a choral festival, which is performative, but also a national conference where we, we have sessions that speak about various aspects of this music, both in terms of its culture, its history, and its impact. Um, and so that's very important that people understand the history and, and that gets preserved as well. Um, but uh, especially as the spirituals are music, it, you have to hear the music, you have to sing the music in order, it doesn't make sense to only talk. It's like being a chef and only uh, talking about the food and never tasting the food. What is the point? <laughs> then we finish off our concert um, with combined choirs, Spiritus Project and Cantorai joining together on O Freedom, Brightazeal Denard, another mainstay in, in, in uh, spirituals, and also William Dawson's famous Ezekiel Saw the Wheel. Yes. Really looking forward to this concert. Um, I know the singers are as well. Um, so what has it been like for you? This is a little <laughs> break outside of the norm for you, being a college professor and, and all that. Uh, we certainly have enjoyed our time with you. Not just enjoyed, that's, that's uh, almost too trite of a word, but uh, have gained so much in appreciation for you as a consummate musician about the repertoire, um, and you as a family member. Um, and, and, I, and I hope you feel that from Cantorai. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, I think one of the first 
analogies I used, it felt like being a, a kid in a candy store to work with Cantorai, and that has not changed. I, I was a fan before the invitation, and so to have the opportunity to work with Cantorai is one of those uh, once in a million kind of experiences. It's, it's like being a violinist and being asked to play a Stradivarius. Uh, a pianist who gets the opportunity <laughs> to play the, the Steinway. I have more opportunities to play Steinway than I do to play, yeah. you know, work with a group like Cantorai. Those, are, those come far and few uh, for me. Um, most of my work is done with amateur groups, which I, I don't have, you know, it doesn't bother me to do that, but um, it, it dictates the, the quality, not the quality, but the, the types of repertoire I'm able to engage with. So to have this opportunity, and as you said earlier on, to be so generous as to say, here, and I can only imagine, you say, here, t take the Mercedes out for a spin. <laughs> but you've been so kind, and, and Cantorai has been so welcoming and so generous. Yes, I, it, after these few weeks of working together, it has started to feel like, like family, and, and they've been so welcoming and, and so generous with their spirit and giving and, and, and indulging me in my little stories in the middle of rehearsals and you know, being willing to come along on the journeys I try to pull them into, into my vision of the music. They've been very kind and very generous, which has been an awesome experience. Well, I can't wait to share this program, Journey to Freedom, with our um, audience members. Um, May as well make sure you know the dates. It'll be, I'm sure, in the description of this video, but it's May 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Um, 21st at First Plymouth Congregational Church, and the 22nd at 3 p.m. at Welshire Presbyterian. Roger, it's been great to speak with you. Um, I value our friendship very much, and I can't wait to see what the future holds with our continued uh, work together. Likewise, thank you. Thanks.